Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Creator and the Lord Jesus Christ. So glad to welcome you to worship this Sunday morning. Uh, a, a wonderful announcement. This past week, the worship task force met on Tuesday morning and decided that it is, we can return to a form of modified in-person worship. And we're going to do that on Sunday evenings at 5 p.m., modified worship complete with masks, You'll be asked to register in advance, um, but uh, we're going to limit that to 30 people to start off with, and we'll do that for a while, and if things uh, progress nicely, then perhaps we'll look at increasing that number. But if you've been yearning to come back in the sanctuary, beginning next Sunday evening at 5, you will have the opportunity to do so. So we pray God's blessing continue to be upon you as we uh, take the precautions we need to, but we move forward as we are able. And this reminds me, this news reminds me of what the psalmist said. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And though you, we are gathered from different parts, we are all in the house of the Lord this morning. Wherever you find yourself is the temple of the Most High. God is with us. Emmanuel, we come because Christ indeed is the Lord's presence in our midst. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ is present wherever we go and wherever we are. So I pray that through the prayers and the praises, the scriptures and its proclamation, that we'll be all led with hearts lifted to the gates of heaven itself. Let us continue to prepare our hearts and minds for worship of Almighty God. Let us pray. God of heaven and earth, you are holy and enthroned in praise. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. Be near to us this day, almighty God, and in your mercy, 
be our help and our shield. In our time of trouble, with hearts full and weary, we offer you our praise and glory that it may be pleasing to you. Do not forsake us, rather in our affliction, heal us. In our doubt, hold us close. In our certainties, bless us with humility. In our worship, may we celebrate your glory and serve as faithful disciples through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. <clears throat> our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God in confidence. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins together with the words as printed in your bulletin. Gracious and loving God, forgive our lack of trust in you. Have mercy on us and forgive us. Help us when we hesitate and strengthen us when we are weak. Breathe your spirit afresh into our hearts and minds and in our very lives so that we have the courage to follow Jesus wherever he takes us. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Be kind to one another and tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. The peace of Christ be with you. Please offer one another a sign of this peace. Good morning. Today we have a very special day for some of our Sunday school children. Today we are honoring those who are receiving Bibles, just like this one. We all love to read stories and have stories read to us. Many of you, many of you probably have a favorite one. The Bible is a book that tells us the story of God's people. We are giving Bibles to the third graders because they are now old enough to read them themselves. We are unable to celebrate with them in person, so they will be picking up their Bibles this year, which will now be formally dedicated by a member of the uh, Children's Sunday School Committee. Thanks, Aya. My name is David Blaze, and I am the chair of the Children's Ministry Committee. Our committee, on behalf of Brick Church, presents Bibles to the third grade children in our church. At their baptism, we make promises to our children to guide and to nurture them by word and deed, by love and prayer, encouraging them to know and follow Christ, and through fellowship, strengthen their family ties to the household of God. When we make these promises to our children, we commit to teach them the stories of God's people. To all those who are receiving Bibles, 
we encourage you to take your Bibles, read it, bring it with you to worship, and know that it is full of God's promises and love for you. On behalf of the Brick Church, I am pleased that the following children have been presented with a Bible to read and study. join your hearts with mine in prayer. Holy God, we bless our beloved children. May they each grow in the knowledge of your love for them. May they see their own lives connected to the stories of your people. Give them minds to understand your word and hearts to trust in you. Help us all, O oh God, to support and care for the children of the church. In your name we pray. Amen. In this second week of our Lenten series, From Crisis to Christ, we continue to explore how, in times of crisis, theologians combined combed the pages of scripture to unlock profound truths empowering people with hope and vision. This week, we turn to Genesis and one of the classic call passages with Abraham. In this text, we find the quintessential covenant between God and humanity that revealed to the people of the Reformation God's one plan of salvation. Let us pray. God, your will for our world is goodness and truth. In your word, we see your steadfast plan is carried through all history. In your promise to Abraham and Sarah, 
may we see ourselves and commit all that we are to your good will. Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 7 and 15 through 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout the, their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. The word of the Lord. The biggest ideas of theology are meant for the biggest controversies and for the greatest moments of human adversity that propel us ever further into understanding the nature of God and the divine plan. Today we will explore what it means that the Lord is a God of covenants. Through a cursory glance of scripture, one might be led to think that God dealt with uh, people in the time of Adam through righteousness, through people in the time of Moses, through uh, rituals and laws, and in the time of Christ, through grace. One is left with the impression that God is haphazardly trying different tactics to try to penetrate the thickness of the human skull and spirit, but often failing most of the time. This view that God uses different modes in different times of history unfortunately has enabled severe abuses of power and power grasp to distort the nature of the gospel within the church. In medieval times, the church had a stranglehold on the people and medieval theology only made it worse. The church taught that you could not go to heaven unless you were righteous. This righteousness came through the infusion of grace in the sacraments. Infusion, much like if you take a bag of uh, tea leaves and put them in hot water, it infuses that cup of tea. And the sacraments were meant to infuse the entire person with God's grace. And furthermore, the person had to participate and had to cooperate with this infusing power. And that was an example of a saint. But the church could easily withhold these sacraments if you weren't being properly obedient to the church, and it costs, sometimes a lot. It could cost you your life if you dared speak out against the hierarchy of the time, just as what happened to Jan Hus in 1415. He was executed for all things unlicensed preaching and specifically preaching against indulgences, which happened to be a rather nifty fundraising arm of the church at that time. Indulgences were a trick that 
uh, relatives could pay in order to spring their loved ones out of purgatory, that place in between life here on earth and heaven hereafter, a place where you had to suffer torture for the sins that you had committed in this life. But you could help your relative, deceased relative, escape purgatory if you paid a sufficient amount of money. Now, the Madison Avenue marketers would be jealous of the marketing at the time. One John Tetzel, an emissary of the church, had the following jingle. Every coin in the coffer rings a soul from purgatory springs. Sadly, widows had to struggle between financial stability and giving sufficient funds to the church to spring their deceased loved one from an eternity of torture. And in the end, for most people in this time, in this period of history, after a relatively short and brutal life, the likelihood of an eternity or at least a really long times in flame and torture is exactly what awaited you. It was in the midst of such abusive practices that 16th century Reformed theologians like Enrique Bollinger, John Calvin, and Ulrich Zwingli dug deeper into Scripture and saw a thread that tied the entire Bible together. That thread was covenants. And once again, by digging deeper into Scripture, theologians enabled people to go from a time of crisis and draw closer to Christ. They observed that God made covenants throughout the history uh, with Adam, with Moses, with Abraham. And each, con was, each covenant was a contract of sorts, executed by God, the promisor, for the promisee, that is, God's people. Each covenant represented a phase in God's one plan of salvation, not a series of failed attempts by God. Calvin and others argued that salvation is not found in the dispensers of various religious practices but rather salvation is found precisely in the fulfillment of these covenants. The paradigmatic covenant was thought to be from our text this morning in which God says, I am God Almighty, Abraham. Walk before me, before me blameless and I will make my covenant between me and you and make you exceedingly numerous. Now certainly, at first glance, this covenant sounds as if it's conditional, as if Abraham and Israel had to achieve a certain level of obedience. Blamelessness, in fact, is what God calls for with Abraham. But it is at this point that a wider reading of Scripture is required. For if we turn to the 15th chapter of Genesis, there we learn that it was faith that was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. And suddenly, and this was pivotal, those exploring covenant theology found that this false law gospel bifurcation between the Old and the New Testament was a complete fabrication and it utterly dissolved before their approach. They realized it was always grace after Adam, not law in the Old Testament and grace in the New. It was always grace. John Calvin observed as much when he wrote, the covenant made with the patriarchs is so much like ours in substance and reality that the two are actually one and the same. Now, in God's covenant with David, David failed time and time again, even to the point of having his mistress husband murdered. 
And in the covenant with Moses, the Ten Commandments were constantly abrogated by the people to the point of idol worship and abusing the poor. Yet Israel remains the chosen people. And sadly, endlessly throughout history, the church has seemingly failed also with a relentless zeal. But once God makes the covenant, the covenant stands. And the new covenants don't abrogate the old, they simply add on to it. God keeps the contract intact. Now it's true, the New Testament simply upon reading it just feels more gracious. But we have to remember that's a very short swath of history compared to the Old Testament. And the New finds its foundation in the Old Covenant, and the Old finds its fulfillment in the New Covenant. Thus, they are one and the same. And yet, I will grant you, there is something troubling about this interpretation. For God is a Lord that demands obedience. That was why these covenantal contracts were created to begin with. And these contracts were contracts under seal. And historically, contracts under seal were stamped to show that the parties intended the agreement to entail consequences. And these consequences show us, the seals show us that God is serious. The covenant with Moses was sealed through sacrifices. The covenant with Christ is sealed through baptism. And the covenant with Abraham was sealed with circumcision. God really was serious. God, in fact, requires Abraham to be blameless, as we observed. And any contract that doesn't require one party to uphold its end of the bargain isn't worth the paper it's printed on, it seems. And God took them very seriously. God was furious with David for his betrayal. God was cut to the heart at Israel's disobedience, and surely God is filled with sorrow and anger at the church's failure to walk in the ways of Christ as we should. It was this evidence from Scripture of these kinds of sorrow and anger of God that allowed the medieval church to demand all types of obeisance simply in hopes of appeasing an angry and wrathful God. But if we continue to examine this covenantal contractual thread, we will see that God's plan offers an amazing and incredible twist a twist which keeps the integrity of the contracts, which respects God's demand for loving obedience, and which in the end enables grace to win once and for always. Now, in legal terms, and I'm sure I'm going to get this wrong, so I apologize to all the lawyers tuning in, the divine contract between God and humanity is ultimately fulfilled by what is known in legal parlance as a third-party beneficiary, who is neither the promisor, that is, God Almighty, nor the promisee, that is, God's people, but rather is one who stands to benefit from the contract's performance. This third party may legally enforce the contract if they fulfill its obligations. Well, I imagine you've already realized who that third party is. And the Lord Christ gives this promise of fulfillment at the Last Supper. I give you a new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. And in Hebrews 9, we read, it tells us that he is the mediator of the new covenant, 
so that those who are called may receive the promise eternal inheritance. Jesus is that third-party beneficiary who perfectly lives out humanity's side of the contract. It is called a new covenant, but it is rooted in the old. Jeremiah speaks of this new covenant. And in our text this morning, God promised to establish this covenant with Abraham, also with Abraham's descendant, that is singular. That word descendant or offspring is not plural, but it is singular, and Jesus is that one single descendant through which the contract is fulfilled. This is what Galatians tells us. He is that descendant of Abraham who fulfills the covenant. Thus, Jesus unifies all of Scripture and meets and fulfills the covenants on our behalf. And since Jesus, of course, is God in the flesh, we realize in the end it is God that fulfills both sides of the contract. Since God stood to benefit from the fulfillment of this contract, as the Gospel of John tells us, because God so loved the world. And it was this final set of observations that freed the prison of the reformers' minds and the people in the medieval ages. That God, not us, fulfills the obligations, which means people's souls were not in the hands of the ritual and rites of the church. And that, in turn, gave them courage to rise up against the injustice. And rather than being filled with despondency, with financial ruin, and with fear of hell, the common person was filled with hope and power to rise up against tyranny and to find everlasting hope in the good news of the gospel. And tree, true freedom was realized at last. True hope was restored. Hope in the hereafter and hope in the here and now because it was the Reformation that unlocked the key that transformed the planet. At this point, this may all sound like an interesting history lesson, but I have seen it become so much more than that. I have seen it unlocked tortured souls that were weighed down with guilt and with sin and with disbelief. In the South, they have a practice known as the altar call. And in the altar call, people come before the whole congregation and profess their faith in Jesus Christ. And indeed, I believe this has enabled endless scores of people to commit to a life of faith. But for some, it has been very problematic. And they have told me that they've gone to the altar again and again and again and again. Because, well, they're still sinners. They're not sure if their faith was the right kind of faith for Christ to truly let them in. And there are other people racked with guilt over not living up to what it is to be a follower of Christ. And it all has to do with a deep-seated feeling that we are still required to be blameless before God and that God is going to hold that to us, hold our feet to the fire, so to speak. That we have to fulfill our side of the covenant. And I've spoken with many people in my pastor's study and tried to explain to them that that is no longer their responsibility because of Christ.
Imagine you owe several million dollars in back taxes on your house. And you've got absolutely no way to pay for it. You fully expect the government or some creditor is going to come and take their house, take your house. That's what the contract stipulates. And you feel completely lost. And then a generous benefactor comes and pays off your debt in full. Now, according to the law, that house is yours. And nobody can take it from you. And there is nothing you can ever do to pay back that benefactor. except to say, thank you. I hope by now you see it. Yes, God's contracts did demand obedience, but Jesus did that for me and for you and for everyone. The contract for which you and I owed an infinite debt has been paid off. And like the glory of burning a mortgage, you feel finally and fully free. And it is exhilarating. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, just as God called Adam all those years ago, God names, calls, and blesses all of us to be a people of covenant. Let us respond to that calling, to that covenant, to that grace by sharing what it is that we believe using the affirmation which is printed in your bulletin and taken from the second Helvetic Confession. We believe that the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, was foreordained from eternity by the Father to be the Savior of the world. And we believe that he was born not only when he assumed flesh of the Virgin Mary, and not only before the foundation of the world was laid, but by the Father before all eternity in an inexpressible manner. There is always but one God. There is one mediator between God and men, Jesus the Messiah, the one shepherd of the whole flock, one head of this body, and to conclude one spirit, one salvation, one faith, one testament or covenant, and only one church. Friends, we hear in Scripture Jesus calling us not to give only a portion of our wealth and our belongings, but also our very lives as well. Let us respond to God's grace towards all of us and give out of our own abundance in this time of offering. You can give online or via text.
Friends, over the past year, we have all learned firsthand how we can experience as people spiritual distress, whether it be in mind, body, or spirit. We have all gone through that in this time of pandemic. And so I'd like to highlight today one of our ministries here at Brick Church, the Lay Pastoral Care Team, which reaches out to those of us in this congregation who may be experiencing spiritual distress in mind, body, or spirit. This special group of people reach out in particular to the elderly, but to all people who share a need for spiritual support. They do so through phone calls, through bringing communion, and through other ways that are socially distanced, like sending good old-fashioned snail mail. We give thanks today for this special ministry of Brick Church. And now let us join our hearts and minds in prayer, lifting up that which is on our hearts and minds to God. Let us pray. Creator and redeeming God, we thank you because you have called each one of us by name. You have blessed us and you have made us people of your covenant, a community which is forged in the bond of faith, committed to your love, peace, and justice. In response to your grace, we lift up to you these our prayers for this community, the nation, and the world. Today, God, we pray for your church and for all the ministries of this church, Brick Presbyterian, during this time of transition. We give you thanks for all of the leaders who carefully discern your will we also give thanks, especially for the lay pastoral care team on this day. That represents the caring arm of the church, reaching out to those who need spiritual support, those who are more vulnerable. We pray, God, your blessings upon them, guide and lead them as they attend to the needs of others. We pray also today for our nation and for our world, and in particular, as we approach the one-year mark of going into lockdown, we remember those who have succumbed to COVID-19 during this time of pandemic. We are aware that the effects of COVID are still unknown to us. We are aware that people have been impacted in different ways, in mind, body, and spirit. We pray today, God, in particular for those who have been exposed, those who are ill with COVID, and we lift up all family members of those who grieve their loved ones, the ones who did not survive this illness. We also, in this time, lift up to you those who are near and dear to us, who we know to be suffering. We bring to you also our own personal struggles, and we lift them up to you in this space of silence. To you, O oh God, we entrust these prayers knowing that you alone can provide grace to help in our time of need. We pray all these things in the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
There was a church historian who noted that because Presbyterians were no longer eating their hearts out trying to work out their salvation, that they were free to transform the world. And you know those altar calls, actually they were started in Presbyterian churches in the 1800s, not as a way to get salvation, but as a way to respond to that gift of God, as a way to call people to missions, no longer serving God out of fear or out of hope to gain something, but responding with thanksgiving, thanksgiving and joy for everything that God has done. Feel that freedom and respond to Christ's call out of love. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious unto you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you from this moment on and give you peace forevermore. Amen.